the first session with a multidisciplinary approach to retinopathy of prematurity. I first uh, welcome Dr. Divya Alex to present uh, on the topic retinopathy of prematurity, past, present, and future. So good morning all. I thank Dr. Divya Balakshna ma'am for giving me this opportunity. So this born too soon babies, why is this subset of population so significant? The preterm birth is the leading cause of neonatal mortality. So from ophthalmic point of view, unfortunately, Retinopathy of prematurity is the leading cause of preventable blindness in infants. So the word preventable has to be given so much importance. That means if you act on time, you can save the vision of the kid. So this is the 2010 WHO data. And uh, our country leads the top with 3.5 million preterm births. So this is the 2020 data. So almost the similar pattern continues. So this resulted in strong political commitment to end preventable newborn stillbirths and deaths. So the government set up lots of newborn care, the specialization units and NICUs. So this led to increased survival rate of premature babies who are at risk to develop blindness due to ROP. So imagine if in 2010 there was about 35 lakhs of preterm births and if at least 30 percentage of these babies have access to neonatal care, about 1 lakh babies are found to survive each year who are at risk of developing ROP and they require screening. So the quality of care needs attention. There is no doubt that many of the centers do an excellent job, but owing to the wide variation in the neonatal care, it is found that more mature and heavier babies develop ROP. So currently, we are going through the third epidemic of ROP. So the first epidemic occurred in 1940s and 50s in the uh, United States and Western Europe. And this was the time when they introduced neonatal care and unmonitored oxygen was introduced. So the second epidemic occurred in 1980s and this was due to the increased survival of the extremely large birth weight babies and because of the minimal screening and treatment. And the third epidemic started from 1990s onwards and it's still going, especially in the middle income countries. And this was due to the increased access to the medical technology with earlier viability yet without much of postnatal level of care. So to understand retinopathy of prematurity, we should understand the normal retinal development. So in utero, there is a perfect environment for vasculogenesis. Vasculogenesis is the de novo formation of primitive vascular network. So at the, uh, for the vasculogenesis, the metabolic demand always exceeds the oxygen supply. So there is an always a physiological hypoxia. So this physiological hypoxia induces hypoxic induced growth factors such as VEGF and IGF-1. This drives the angiogenesis, that is the growth of new capillaries from pre-existing blood vessels. So this capillaries, so this angiogenesis occurs up to the aura. Slowly, slowly it occurs up to the aura. So this process starts at 16 weeks of age and the nasal aura will be completed by 8 months and the temporal aura will be completed around 9 to 10 months, that is about 40 weeks. So what happens with this two soon born babies? So in utero, if it was the ambient environment for the preterm babies, no longer the ambient environment exists. So even the atmospheric oxygen is a bit high for them. So then imagine when a baby is having respiratory distress, you start pumping oxygen. So the initial response to this oxygen will be severe vasoconstriction. So the retina sends a false signal that we don't need any more oxygen. So there will be abrupt stoppage of the retinal vasculature. This is the phase one. So along this period, when the baby stabilizes, we pull off the ventilation, give blended air or room air, there will be a lot of oxygen fluctuation and oxygen stress. So this stress will gi uh, give rise to oxygen reactive species, releasing the hypoxic induced growth factors and this VEGF and the IGF, everything come back with VEGNs. That is, it is almost 100 times more than what was in utero. So this leads to the vasoproliferative phase, that is the phase two. So this process from the preterm birth to the phase one to the phase two, this almost happens between three to four weeks. That is why we kept it mandatory that every baby, preterm baby, uh, uh, will, must be screened for ROP within 30 days from birth. So this is exactly what is happening in the retinopathy of prematurity. So there is a vascular retina, 
there is an avascular retina first there will be a demarcation line between the both and then it has a breadth width height it is a three dimensional structure now it is a ridge and the vessels grow on to the ridge and on to the uh, vitreous and this starts pulling the retina with a partial detachment and then a total detachment so let's see this through images so this is the avascular retina so when you trace the retinal vasculature you can see the abrupt ending of the retinal vasculature and followed by a translucent zone this is the avascular retina and this is a stage one that is with the vascular retina and the avascular retina there is a demarcation line and in the stage two this line gets to happen a three-dimensional structure attaining a width height and a bed and then this is the ridge that is the stage two and this is the stage three that is the new vessels new blood vessels starting growing into the vitreous cavity and the stage four is a partial retinal detachment and the stage five is the complete retinal detachment it can be an open funnel closed funnel or uh, the closed funnel with the anterior segment findings such as ac shallowing or adhesions so this is the closed funnel rd which was described in 1942 by terry as the retrolendal fibroplasia they thought that is the cataract but this is the end stage of the retinopathy of prematurity that is the total retinal detachment so this is the new icrop classification that is the third edition so as we are a part of neonatal specialists we should be thorough with this new terminologies icrop was first developed in 1984 and they made mandatory to screen all preterm babies for why, why this third edition because of the innovations in ophthalmic imaging and because of the novel anti of introduction so this is the zones of rop so there is the zone one that is right at the center the distance between the fovea and the optic disc twice the distance on both its sides that is the zone one and the zone two it is the circle that is ending in the nasal or nasal aura and the temporal remaining crust is the zone three but in the icrop three they have added a new terminology that is the posterior zone two that is two disc diopter peripheral to the zone 1. So this is the posterior zone 2 and this will be the anterior zone 2. So any disease occurring in the posterior zone 2 should be more worrisome. And this is the another terminology that is included that is notch. So notch means incursion of the ROP lesion by 1 to 2 clock hours into a posterior zone. So earlier you would have called this as a zone 1 disease but now we know that it is a notch that is zone 1 secondary to this notch and uh, now uh, the next uh, term was the plus disease spectrum so the plus disease was defined from 1985 but now it is considered as a spectrum or a continuum of disease which is associated with vascular dilatation and tortuosity whether it is arterial or venous tortuosity it doesn't matter it is determined by the abnormal looking vasculature determined by the vessels within the zone one so another terminology was the aggressive retinopathy of prematurity. Earlier it was called as AP ROP or the aggressive posterior ROP. Now it is just called aggressive retinopathy of prematurity. This was first added in 2005 to describe a severe rapidly progressive form of ROP located in the zone 1 or posterior zone 2. But now it has been increasingly recognized in larger preterm and beyond posterior retina. So they have this... Uh, the key diagnostic features are the tempo of the disease and the appearance of the vascular abnormalities rather than the location of the disease. So the classic findings will be vascular looping, severe plus a combination of hemorrhages and proliferation. And uh, this may be due to the severe vasoconstriction which I have already explained, mostly oxygen induced retinopathy. So these are the changes that uh, uh, came in ICROP3. So we will be continuing our session with screening, treatment, and uh, whether it is ROP or any other disease. So imagine, e so remember that even a single blind child is a tragedy. So it is our responsibility to screen them at the right time and save their vision. So once again, I thank you. Thank you, Divya Alex, for that wonderful presentation. Now I uh, request Dr. Lekha. Uh, she's a consultant at uh, Giridharai Institute. She will be presenting on the screening protocols and medical legal implications in ROP.
Good morning. I thank Dr. Divya, Dr. Divya and KSOS Scientific Committee for giving me this opportunity. Just let, we'll first see what is the rationale for screening for ROP and whether it satisfies the Wilson and Younger's criteria for screening of any disease. Firstly, it should be a public health problem. This has already been emphasized. It should have a latent or an early asymptomatic stage. Again, this has been explained. And one point I would like to stress again that this is a disease which is never present at birth. So we don't need to start screening right from birth. It's a dynamic, time-bound disease. It takes at least two to three weeks. And then in the subsequent weeks, it can either progress or regress. And again, this is a disease which gives us a good screening window where if you start examining the babies, we can detect the disease at a point where it would have become obvious otherwise. The natural history of the disease should be known. Yes, cryo study has shown that if you don't treat 50% of the
disease is present or not, and always check for the duct pat patency and check the IOP. And then we can decide whether a pre-op anti-VEGF is also required. And a few signs which actually are poor prognostic indicators are shallow anterior chamber, membrane over the pupil, irregular pupil with posterior sinecae. When many of these cases, when they present with the stage 5 ROP, a B scan is mandatory, basically because you need to see what is the posterior retina looks like, whether it is posteriorly closed, whether it is open, or if the baby is presenting little late at four or five months, then the baby might already having the complication features like subretinal exudates or crystal deposits. So these, when you see these subretinal deposits, that is again a poor indicator. So the uh, most common indications for a surgery are stage 4A and stage 4B, uh, stage 4B ROP, stage 5 ROP. In some cases, babies present with vitreous hemorrhage, which preclude the uh, delivery of laser. So in some cases where the B scan shows that the retina doesn't, it's not uh, detached or anything, still we have an option to give anti wedge of these days. And sometimes post laser, whether, when the laser is very intense, on follow-up, some babies very rarely develop uh, breaks related to laser and they can develop a combined retinal detachment. So when you deliver the laser, you have to monitor the intensity of the laser burns. And the surgical options include lens sparing vitrectomy, especially in stage 4A and 4B. 4B in the zone 2, you can plan for a lens sparing vitrectomy. But in the uh, diseases with stage 4B, especially in zone 3 and stage 5, you will have to uh, sacrifice the lens. So that is lensectomy with vitrectomy. And in diseases with the traction, like a stage 4A in the zone 3 and all, you can get away with just a buc belt buckle. And sometimes babies present very late, actually, maybe like at 6, 7, or 11 years, with some breaks in the periphery leading to a retinal detachment. So in those cases, you can settle it with a scleral buckle also. The main difficulty is because of the small size of the globe, it is very difficult instrumentation. The pass planner is undeveloped. And so when you enter, especially for a lens pairing vitrectomy, you are entering through the pass plicata because the lens is very large and we don't want to injure the lens. The additions and the vitreous is very gel-like, the firm addition between the retina and the vitreous. Uh, and when you place these sclerotomies, you have to see that it, which area the retina is dragged because you might induce an iatrogenic retinal break if you have not done a very careful pre-op evaluation. If you create a break, then it is like uh, uh, you have lost the eye type in, in these cases. So a good pre-op evaluation and then avoid putting the sclerotomy or entry in an area where there is no drag. So the surgeon may have to uh, sit on the nasal side or a temporal side to operate one eye. And you have to remember that in these babies, the pass plana is underdeveloped, so you need to position the sclerotomy as per the age of the baby. So this is a video of a stage 4A ROP. You can see that uh, the retina is dragged, lifted along the arcades. Uh, and temporarily, you can see that both the arcades are uh, adhered together. There is a connection, connection between the superior and inferior arcade lifted vessel. So basically, what you are tackling is the traction, that is the reason why there is an anteroposterior traction lifting the uh, retina from posterior towards the retrolendal space. So you need to release the traction, this retinal addition, that is between the superior and inferior arcade, then between the retina and the disc, and from the retina and the disc towards the retrolendal space. And you can see this in this periphery, actually, the retina again is uh, 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 detached, and you can see that uh, traction between the detached peripheral retina and the disc. So you need to release that traction also. That is why in, uh, when the uh, baby goes for stage five, you will see a trough in the periphery. That is the peripheral lifted retina and the aura serrata. There will be a gap there. So the aim of the surgery is to release these tractions. And you don't expect the retina to settle down on the table. It will take long time for the retina to settle. And this is a, a case of stage 5 ROP. Uh, here you, you, you need to see that because we are uh, planning to remove the lens, the entry is through the root of the iris into the lens. And after removing the lens, Actually, you tease the membranes using two instruments, actually, because you need to enter the retrolendal plane. And the retina is actually dragged and sitting just behind the retrolendal plane. So by, doing the, uh, by re uh, removing these retrolendal membrane, and as I mentioned, there will be a stalk from the disc to the retrolendal space. So you need to dissect and open up the funnel of, from the disc. And in the periphery, as I mentioned, there will be a trough. So you have to release the connection. 
So at the end of the surgery, you don't expect the entire retina to go back, but it is just to release the traction and it will take months for this retina to settle back. And you don't expect a 6.6 6 or 6.24 vision in these babies. If the babies can see at least close to face hand movements or even PL is much better than NNPL. So the aim of the surgery is release, to, uh, release the traction and recovery is gradual over years. But when we operate cases like stage 5, the anatomical success may be ranged between 15 to 60 percentage. While uh, if you get a baby to operate at a stage 4, the anatomical and, uh, success would be up to 90 percentage. And post-op is very important because you need to give spectacle corrections and you better if you are operating unilateral and especially lens sparing, avoid any cycloplegics. This babies require repeated general anesthesia, repeated retinoscopy and glass correction and IOP also need to be monitored because they can have secondary glaucoma. So your uh, care for babies doesn't stop with surgery. This baby has to be followed up lifelong and uh, you need to have a collaboration with your pediatric ophthalmologist and take good care of these babies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Divya. That was an excellent talk. If any of you have any uh, doubts or anything. So now, you, we have time. No, no talks. No, no talks. After lens sparing because of malignant glaucoma. No. no. Especially in unilateral surgeries, because one eye you won't be um, giving any dilating drops, and the other eye, when we give cycloplegics, the risk of amblyopia is there. That is the only reason. Long term, you don't give, actually. And it is important to monitor these babies for these uh, eye glaucoma. They can have this one. And I think maybe uh, one point to add in uh, Indu's uh, talk, it was a very nice talk. So, why do you think that is it important to differentiate these entities from ROP when you screen these uh, babies? Especially cases like that, Nori's and... I see, uh, ROP is a treatable condition, whereas, however, many of these which I had mentioned, they progress very fast to blindness. Whereas ROP, you get a period of interval where you can treat. So early intervention and early diagnosis is very important. Otherwise, these uh, eyes may progress very, very fast to almost blindness. Most of them might be in NPL at birth. So uh, that is why if you want to add. And maybe just to add also like uh, diseases like FEVR is like a lifelong disease. So you need to follow these babies very regularly at fixed intervals. ROP is like once you treat it, but you need to follow for the like spectacle correction, refraction and all those things. But the late complication, especially if you are treated the baby with laser and all is very less. But FEVR is not like that. It can progress at any time. So it's very important to differentiate. And when you see any baby uh, uh, with features like uh, ROP at birth or at one week, then you need to think that this is not ROP. So this, because ROP, it will take at least two weeks for the disease to develop. So that is some of the important uh, differentiating features. Uh, Dr. Natasha, do you, uh, how often have you come across this recurrence with anti-VEGF? And have you ever re-injected anti-VEGF in these babies? Uh, I often come, uh, come across recurrence, the, what is called reactivated disease. Uh, it was less with bevacizumab when we were using bevacizumab. It is more with ranibizumab. And uh, I usually find that the recurrence comes like in about four to, like I said, four to six weeks is the usual time when it comes back. And uh, as soon as it comes back, I usually proceed with laser. I have not re-injected any baby. I do not recommend re-injection because we don't know the long-term effects even now. And, um, and once you re-inject again, follow-up period is now going to extend even further. There is no way to follow up these babies unless you do a GA. And how, how often will you do a GA and look for a reactivation? So if you are re-injecting, maybe you should laser immediately after re-injection as well. So your current uh, protocol is like you give anti vegf then uh, at one month you do peripheral laser, is it like that or? One, mo one month, uh, no. I see if you are doing in zone 1 disease, it is going to take more than one month for the vessels to proceed to mid zone 2. So uh, once the vessels have nicely vascularized over the macula and proceeded to mid zone 2, which is, would be your type 2, <coughs> uh, no, type uh, 1 ROP, 
either uh, when when it has proceeded well you can laser off the uh, periphery or if there is any line or ridge showing that there is reactivation then you can laser and in in case of reactivation i laser earlier also otherwise i wait for at least 6 weeks so that if it is zone 2 posterior or zone 1 it will take that much time for it to reach mid zone 2 and, and i then, think then at a time like mostly they will be around 36 to 38 weeks of gestation at that time maximum 40 41 by that time you can laser you don't need to wait for follow up follow up till 54 look for persistent avascular retina and then laser yeah i think earlier the dictum used to be like uh, rop if you have to treat treat by 40 weeks that's so that right, used to be right. the i think we're yeah. moving back to that itself and uh, this is the consensus from, it's not my consensus, it is the consensus from IROP that you laser when there is reactivation or you laser once you are, uh, once the baby has passed mid zone 2. And the, as the baby grows, it becomes difficult to actually examine the periphery in OPD, yes, then the baby then, would require anesthesia. Correct. And even for so. laser, you can't laser a 54 uh, week baby in the NICU. And in fact, NICU people won't accept also. Then you will have to go to the pediatric ICU. Then you have to, sometimes you have, to, uh, definitely they will require GA also. So altogether I feel we should move back to the combined treatment. Uh, Dr. Lega, because you uh, go for screening in many hospitals, what do you think is the major barrier in getting these babies for screening and to follow these babies? I think screening is not a barrier anymore because most of the NICUs have well-developed protocols set for screening. It is only the follow-ups. Again, I think because of uh, improvement in the awareness, we are not losing much babies. And uh, like when there are issues, they are moving to a different uh, location. We can always connect them to the neonatologist in that place or networking also helps in that. So overall, um, I find the um, follow-up or uh, the um, loss to follow-up has really come down. But certain things like the awareness among neonatologists as to when they should send for screening, these things are, these are the areas I think which we have to improve. Like you have neonatologists sending the baby within a week of birth to those who are sending to you at three months after birth. So those, these are the areas where I think we have to have better interaction with the neonatologist and improve. I think that is very important. You have some questions. Ma'am, as ma'am was telling, uh, previously we were injecting zone 1 babies. Now we are injecting zone 2 posterior babies also at some time. So for zone 1, as you said, uh, like it is difficult to reach up to zone 3. But for zone 2 posterior babies, what we see is especially with Avastin, because it gives a longer period of time. So some babies, they reach almost zone 3. So uh, these babies, like, uh, do you uh, follow up and leave or uh, you routinely do laser after that specified period of time? No, the dictum is uh, not zone 3. It is vascularization up to aura. If uh, you can follow up up to aura, I have babies. Initially, we were not lasering, no? We were just injecting. That is called anti of monotherapy. So when we were uh, doing monotherapy, we had babies who would vascularize till aura. Like 48 weeks, they will, 48, 50 weeks. My average uh, vascularization time was uh, 52 weeks. By 52 weeks, a lot of them were vascularizing till aura. So if that is the case, if you are confident that there is no reactivation, it has reached zone 3, so you don't think that the baby, and you can follow up some of these babies, even if we, they, if we say they are growing, they don't really become really big. So some of them you are able to follow up, you can do. If you think you won't be able to follow up, if you see any sign of reactivation, or if you think it is progressing really slowly and it has not crossed mid-zone 2 uh, as fast as you would expect it to, it is better to um, laser. And I would also, at this point, add that you should move away from bevacizumab. If a problem occurs, you are going to inject in the NICU. There is no sterile, except the regu regular sterility of the NICU, there is not an OT sterility there. If you run into a problem, there is nothing to support bevacizumab because the court will not allow just studies. All the major institutes have moved away from Avastin, so especially with biosimilars. Now I think uh, the, the INTAS biosimilar has approval from DCGI for uh, ROP, specifically for ROP. So if you want to use a biosimilar, you can use that. 
and uh, there is no excuse to use avastin anymore in these babies one more doubt madam uh, we are uh, saying that zone 1 uh, any stage with plus we are injecting uh, but uh, some cases like half zone or rop sometimes they develop a faint line which is very close to the fovea there won't be a much of plus disease or anything like that sometimes loops will be there but loops are also considered as a high risk factor now, yes, right? yes so uh, if there is a stage 1 without any obvious plus in zone 1 then are we uh, justified injecting. in injecting i would ask for a closer follow up maybe okay. twice in a week so go okay. every 3 days you can look at what is happening do not keep it for one week like yeah. we routinely do it will progress really yeah. fast and then you will because sometimes fear. it is very scary it is very close to it the fovea it is fovea. very scary yes so. and uh, also once the traction develops then you can't inject anymore so there is a very small, small. window of uh, opportunity where you can intervene so every 2 days or every 3 days you have to follow up the moment there is dilatation or there is that what we call flat neovascularization you have to inject you can't wait okay ma'am thank you so i think uh, thank you everyone we will conclude this